Okay, so I want to write my first C++ program. I'm going to again use the, the Vim editor, my programmer's editor. Uh, I will specify the name of the file that I want to create and in this case I'm calling it hello. Now the lab is going to have you essentially do exactly what I'm doing in here, right? So the lab will basically be an, an exercise of parroting me. I think though the file is called lab2.cpp instead of hello.cpp. I hit enter. Hit I to go into insert mode. And now I can start typing in my first C++ program. Uh, this first line you know, actually, maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna type in the entire program, and then I'll just come back and talk about it. All right. So one thing to note about C++ is that despite symbols here and there, if you're completely unfamiliar with it, despite weird symbols here and there like the pound sign and, and these chevrons here and so on and so forth, it is by and large, it's human readable. All right? uh, but the computer will not be able to understand it and process it in its human readable form. It has to be boiled down to, or the technical term would be compiled into a something that the machine can read. And so we use a compiler for that. What I'll do to illustrate, I'll come back and talk about this program, but let me run through uh, showing this program in action. I type colon wq to write and quit out. If I do an ls, sure enough, there is uh, Hello.cp. Oh, I put some notes. Let me sidetrack for a moment. I'll post this with the daily diatribe. Uh, I created a notes box. I didn't want to forget talking about this. Uh, this is a really nice link right here, uh, learning the command line. So if you've never done anything on Linux or Unix before, the ls and the cd and the make directory and the bim and the so on and so forth, uh, you're going to want to check this out. Let me see if I, I'll go there and actually show it off a little bit. So it's saying continue. I kind of went in here a little bit. Uh, it gives you kind of a description of what various things mean here and then it asks you to do something and you actually right here in your web browser you can do what it's saying and try it out and list all the files in the directory in the working directory so ls all right uh, then type cd 2015 cd 2015 and so on and then it says uh, again print the current working directory okay now I am in this directory ls see what's in there anyway this thing will walk you through all the different commands kind of teaching them as you go and then you can go to the next exercise and so on and so forth so I really recommend you take half an hour or so to uh, kind of go through that And again, I'll post that URL. Okay, where was I? So I have actually written my first C++ program. Uh, you can call this anything you want. What you want to be consistent about is making sure that the file ends with a .cpp. Now let me take a moment and let's say that I had a typo. Let's say that I... Um, All right. So let's say that I accidentally forgot one of the letter P's and I just have hello.cp. Uh, how do you recover from this horrible life-threatening emergency? The command is move, which is synonymous with rename. 
So move is, is general. I can move files from any part of the file system to any other part of the file system. But if I take a file in my current directory, which in this case is this directory, and I am, uh, when I did an ls, these are the files in my current directory, I can take hello.cp and then a space, and then I can just give it the new name. And that's all there is to it. I can do an ls, and there it is renamed. Okay. So if you get any naming wrong, uh, that's your easy fix. What I want to do is turn this nice uh, human-readable program into something the machine understands. The command to do that is G++. And then after G++, I give it the name of the file that I want to uh, turn into machine-readable code. Uh, again, the terms I should be using are the official terms. G++ is what is called a compiler, and what I'm about to do is compile my program. I hit enter, and you will see what happens with nearly every Unix command, which is if it worked correctly, you get absolutely no feedback. Okay. And the, reason, and the reason is, this is all stuff written by programmers for programmers. They don't want a lot of noise. They don't want a lot of screwing around. They know what they're doing. They just want to do their work and get it done. And they only want to be told something if something's gone wrong. Okay? So uh, it is working correctly. Now I want to see if anything's changed in my directory. So I do an ls. And now we see a, another file in there. Uh, this one's called a.out. The compiler will, by default, assuming there are no problems, it will always convert that program into something that you can run called a.out. Uh, you are not obliged to go with that. G++ has an option, and options for nearly all uh, Unix commands begin with a hyphen. So actually, let me give you an example. LS, LS has an option called uh, that begins with a hyphen called dash L. That means get a long listing. Now there's a lot of stuff here that you won't understand. Stop that. What's it? Uh, there's a lot of stuff here that's not necessarily understandable. But I'm just illustrating that different commands have different options. G++ has various options as well. So let me clear to get to the top here. G++ hello.cpp. I can give an option. I don't want it to be called a.out. I want it to be called monkeyfish. Okay. And I hit enter. And now if I do an ls, you'll note that I have a, a program, a, another file here called monkeyfish. So both a.out and monkeyfish are compiled versions of hello.cpp. These are programs we can run in the exact same sense that ls is something we can run. After all, ls is nothing magic. It's actually a program that was written by a programmer some time back in the dark ages, and we're just using it. Let's use the program that I just wrote. Uh, what you want to do is you want <coughs> to run something in your current directory. Okay, Your current directory is always uh, represented by a period. So let me tell you, show you something that's redundant. If I say ls period, that means I want to see the contents of my current directory. right? If I provide no information to ls, it assumes I mean my current directory. So that's what I mean by redundant. And I'm just trying to point out that the period means your current directory. So in my current directory, now I need a slash. I want to run, and I can run either a.out or monkeyfish. I'll run monkeyfish. I hit enter. and there is my machine, the machine-readable version of my program that just ran. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the program itself. Uh, all right. This God bless it. I need to get a big chair in here. I'm so uncomfortable. It's up and down, up and down. Okay, uh, this first line, <clears throat> so 
some of these lines uh, before you you won't fully understand them until uh, we're a fair amount into the semester. So you can blindly include these two. I'll describe them briefly, and if it doesn't totally make sense, that's okay. If you just automatically include those first two lines in every program you write, you'll be fine. Okay, but very briefly, uh, include means please give me a copy of a file and put it right at this line. And there actually is a file out there in the file system somewhere called IO stream. The I stands for input, the O stands for output, and the way they, the analogy that they use for input and output in C++ is one of streams, as in creeks or rivers, a stream, uh, because letters are flowing out to the screen or stuff is flowing in from the keyboard. That's where they came up with that uh, particular analogy. So there's a file called IO stream. It's just a file that contains information that allows us to use input and output correctly. Don't have to know a lot about it. If you blindly put line one there, that'll work great. <clears throat> Using namespace standard, uh, the language contains a bunch of facilities which are in what are referred to, quote, as the standard library. And normally, whenever you use any of these features, you have to put STD in two colons before everything. Uh, without completely understanding it, let me just do it. Okay, I would normally, <clears throat> I normally have to do this. And what happens is, if I have a whole bunch of output in my program, this just becomes a pain in the ass to type STD colon colon, STD colon colon everywhere. So what this is doing is this is saying, let's just assume that I'm using STD so that I don't have to type it everywhere. Okay, so that's all that's doing is it's saving me some keystrokes. Next, we have uh, this right here. This gets to uh, probably one of the basic features of C++ and C from which it came, which is this idea of functions. Now, the functions that you all are familiar with is something like f of x equals x squared, all right? So the function has a name, and in this case, the function's name is this. Now in mathematics, you're going to call it f or g or h, right? They, they're big on the one-letter names. In C++, uh, we want to be more descriptive than that. We could certainly use one-letter names, but we tend to be more descriptive. And we give our functions a name. This right here would be the input to the function, and this would be what the function does, and this could be arbitrarily complex. So in C++, this is one operation basically, and in C++ you could have hundreds or even thousands of operations, okay? So you could do x squared, and then you could multiply x by five, and then you could find the current time, and uh, calculate the number of seconds since 1970 and divide that by 83, right? You can go on and on and on, do calculation after calculation after calculation inside of a function that gets beyond just this simple mathematical representation. Uh, but anyway, we have the name of the function, the inputs to the function, and then the I'll call it the body of the function, what the function does. And finally, what's really implied in these mathematical uh, representations of functions is that this function returns something to us. There's an output to the function, okay? So these things are, there are similarities to what we have in C++. So I'm gonna table discussing this up here for a moment. Uh, the function, let me give the equivalent of this right here. So my function's name is f. It has, I'll, let me start with the mathematical version. Okay, that's a mathematical version. And C++, first is I have to say what kind of thing f returns. And what, what I mean by what kind of thing is that uh, the language differentiates between characters like the letter H or strings like the phrase hello world, between integers, the ordinals, uh, floating point numbers, right, uh, numbers with fractional portions. You have to actually, for a, a C++ function, you have to specify what kind of thing the function is going to give back. So I'm going to say that I'm working with integers, 
and there's actually a keyword called int, which means integer. Then I give the name of the function, and then I provide the inputs. But just like I did with what the function ultimately gives back, I have to specify what kind of thing is being given to the function as an input. So I would say that x is an integer that's coming into the, to my function. Then I provide the body of the function, and the body of the function is always surrounded by curly braces. And it's at this point where I could have thousands of lines if I wanted it. In this case, I'm just trying to simulate this function right here where I am multiplying x times x. Uh, and then I need to explicitly say that I want to give the result back. So there's actually a keyword called return. And at the end of most statements, I have to put a semicolon. If you look up at lines 6 and 7, you'll note that there's semicolons at the end of each of those statements. So I have to put a statement at the end here. So that's a general model for functions in C++. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, you don't need to know that for today's lab. My whole reason for introducing that is so that I could come back here and talk about this. Now this makes slightly more sense. This is a, follows the same format. There's that word int. Again, there, this function is ultimately going to give back an integer number. Then uh, the name of the function is main. So we're really not restricted into what we call our functions. There can't be, there are some rules. There can't be spaces in the name. The name cannot start with a number, so I can't say six main, although main six is just fine. Uh, you can use underscores. Uh, you can have uppercase and lowercase. Uh, you, by and large, can't use, other than the underscore, you can't use symbols. Like, I can't put a pound sign here. I can't put a quote here. Um, but letters, numbers, and underscores are fine. Anyway, this function is called main. I'll get back to the name of this function in a moment. And here we have a set of parentheses. So just like is shown on line 13, inside of the parentheses you put the inputs to the function. This is showing that this particular function doesn't take any inputs, and that's fine as well. Uh, now I have the curly braces on lines uh, opening on line 5 and closing on line 8. So that's the body of the function, similar to lines 14 and 16. And then in the body of the function, I'm doing two things. One is I'm sending output to the screen. Uh, so C out is saying I want to send something to the screen. Uh, normally, each thing we send to C out is separated by chevrons. So I have a pair of chevrons here. Uh, I'm calling them chevrons. It's just the less than sign typed twice. And in this case, I want to send out a couple words. And I send out hello world. Note that I put the words in double quotes. Okay. The reason I put it in double quotes is if I don't put quotes around it, <clears throat> let me actually, uh, I'm going to, let me delete this temporarily. Let me do it like that. The reason I am putting that in double quotes is because if I don't put it in double quotes, this means something entirely different. What that means is that uh, just like if we then go back down to lines 14 through 17, x represents a variable just like it does in mathematics, right? And on line 7, that's saying that I want to print out the contents of a variable. But I didn't. I wanted to print out the actual letter X, so that's why it's in double quotes. So that's why hello world is put in double quotes, because if I don't do that, for instance, if I don't have that in double quotes, that thing, then it thinks that there's a variable, just like on uh, down at the bottom there with that F function, X is a variable, it thinks that hello is a variable. right? In mathematics, there's this tendency to uh, use single letters for variables. It's, it's much more unusual to do that in programming. You tend to want to be descriptive to make it easy to understand. So you have multi-letter variables. Uh, so this isn't at all un unusual. But I, of course, do not have a variable called hello. I want to actually say hello world to the world. So 
so I put it in double quotes. Then I do another set of chevrons, and then there is this right here, which means end line. Now let me show you the difference. Uh, let me introduce something else called the comment. Anywhere I put two slashes, that means that anything that follows with it is totally ignored by the compiler. And you normally use comments to describe how things are working. In this case, I don't want the compiler to be seeing any of this stuff, so I'm putting that in comments. The compiler will ignore it. So what I want to do is illustrate what endline is doing. Let me. Uh, if I've compiled it and I haven't made any changes, then I can just run it. I really haven't made any changes to the program. So when I run it, all right. Now let's compare. Here, let me clear the. Uh, let's compare this. Let me go back into the program and let me get rid of the ENDL. And I'll just end it right there. When I do that, I have to compile it now. Now I'm going to run it. Okay, so you see the difference. I've gotten my prompt back, and I'm able to I'm able to enter commands like ls and so forth. But note that the prompt came right on the heels of the period in "Hello World." That's because in my program I didn't specify that I wanted a new line, I wanted you know an enter key, a carriage return. The term in programming would be a, a new line. So that is the purpose that the ENDL serves, is it puts a new line in there. Yes? Um, how sensitive is like that command space? Is like if you put like a space in the wrong area, would that throw off the entire thing? Uh, meaning like here? Sure. Yeah. So interesting you should ask about spacing. Uh, the exercise on Friday in groups is you're going to come up with a list of all the different ways you can use and abuse and insert spaces and new lines. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll give you the short version of it, which is it's very flexible. There's some things you can't do, but by and large you can. So uh, I could do okay. So uh, <clears throat> the spacing, the, the, so by and large, oh, that wasn't good. I just broke my, get that replaced. Um, by and large, spacing is to accommodate us as human readers of the code, and we space it to make it as readable as possible to us, and the compiler generally doesn't care. So I find that much more readable, so I'll do that. All right, so let me uh, talk about this function. Your pro the programs you write, and there are programs that are certainly out there that are hundreds of thousands or even millions of lines of code. Okay, And a good example of something that's hundreds of thousands of lines of code is something like Microsoft Word or this web browser. Programs like that are fairly complex, take a lot of code to write. There are going to be dozens, hundreds, thousands of functions. The question is, well, if you have thousands of functions in your program, where in the hell does the compiler know where your program starts? And the convention is that you can have exactly one function in your program called main. And in fact, you have to have one function in your program called main, and that's where your program starts. Okay? So that's why I've called this function main. That's where, that's where all the excitement's happening. That's where your smartphone tells you the party's happening. All right. Uh, you also note that it says it returns an integer, which seems a little bit. In I actually return an integer. In this case, I'm returning a zero. Uh, that's a, a little bit weird. I, I'll I'll go ahead and describe to you what it's doing. Is that uh, when I run 
monkey fish, it actually returned to zero, and I have access to that variable out here at the prompt. Again, this is a little bit beyond the scope of the class, but I can use this little um, recipe, if you will, to find out, and you see it shows zero. Let me go in there and try changing it. Let me edit it. Let me return 99 or 999. Let me compile it. Oops. When I run it, oh. let me make it a little bit smaller. I don't want to get into the, to that issue. Echo, that's no nope. monkey fish. Echo that ninety nine. Okay, so that that's main main is when main's done running, it actually returns a number back to this prompt here that you can access. Uh, it happens with all the commands. Ls, I can echo ls return to zero. The reason I return a zero and most of you will return a zero is by convention, it's not mandatory, but by convention if a program works correctly it should give a zero back when it's done running and so that's why def by default everyone has returned zero when something goes wrong you return non-zero for instance let's ls this directory this directory doesn't exist right and it gives me an error now i can say echo dollar question mark and ls gave me a one back and not a zero because something had gone wrong so this is uh that's part of the motivation behind that number being returned all right, so I'll go back to returning zero. Uh, any questions on that? Let me get, lastly, if you ran my helper script, uh, you will, well, actually, let me, let me just, there's a command you can type called history. It shows you everything you've been doing. Uh, for those of you who want to save keystrokes, you may have noticed I've been trying to resist doing it, but my muscle memory takes over and I keep doing it. I've been doing some shortcuts, so let me show you some shortcuts. I can say exclamation point 557, that will rerun command 557, which was ls. I can say exclamation point g, that will rerun the last command that I typed in that began with the letter g, Okay, which was compiling. If I want to go back into my editor, the la what is the editor? It's Vim. So exclamation point V will rerun the last command that began with V, which brings me back here. So what will typically happen is you'll do something. You'll it'll take you two, three, five, ten tries to get this program typed in just right, compiled, and running. Okay, and you'll get errors. So for instance, if I forget a semicolon here, and I compile, it'll give me an error. In this case here, it's nice. It's telling me what's probably wrong here. Uh, then I'm going to go back into the editor, fix it, come out, compile, run. Okay. So it's edit, compile, run, edit, compile, run, edit, compile, run, because things are going wrong. So you're going through this cycle over and over again. It's just a lot faster to use like exclamation point G, exclamation point V, rather than retyping everything every time. With that, we'll see you in lab.